Um, good evening, and a warm, I, I'm thinking a warm welcome, but on a, a, a rather worryingly warm February evening, right? It shouldn't really be this warm. But a warm welcome anyway to you all. Um, to those of us on campus, um, thank you for coming. And those of us watching online, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be looking at the moment to those of us watching online, but I'll, I'll go with that. Um, so uh, from all over the world, welcome as well. Um, and thank you for joining us virtually. So uh, I have to do the, the housekeeping um, for people in the room. So we're not expecting a fire drill. Um, if a fire alarm sounds, the fire exits are clearly marked. I guess that's a clear marking, clear marking, clear marking, clear marking. At the top, yep, you threw there. So that's the fire exits um, and, um, you know, LSE staff will direct you out. So um, also, uh, we um, think it would be great if you would um, post about this event on social media. And the lab's online details are supposed to be, I'm supposed to be able to point to them at this point, um, there, but I can't see if they are. So um, uh, anyway, um, if you're here in the room, just uh, also just make sure your device is on silent. I'll assume that if you're holding a device, it's, it's purely to tweet. Um, and so um, anyway, that's all that stuff done with. So um, welcome again. I'm Elizabeth Robinson. I'm director of Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at LSE. And um, I, I, I'm absolutely delighted, and it's, it's a real privilege, actually, to um, be here for the launch of um, one of the Institute's um, absolute flagship sustainable finance initiatives, the Just Transition Finance Lab, or if I can get the acronym there, JTF Lab, JTFL. Um, I'm not sure what it'll end up being called as its um, nickname moving forward. But, but um, why, why is it so important? I think, you know, I think we're all probably aligned here in the room. Um, ensuring a sustainable future um, is one of the guiding principles of our LSE 2030 strategy. Um, and it carries through all our work, research, um, education, outreach priorities. And I think, you know, many thanks to Manish Shafiq, our former president, Nick Stern, the chair of Grantham LSE, for really pushing through sustainability throughout the, um, throughout the school. So if we go then zoom in on Grantham Research Institute, our purpose uh, is to accelerate the transition and remove obstacles to a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient world. And so in doing that, what's absolutely essential is that, the that we ensure the transition is a socially equitable one, uh, which is why we are investing in this kind of awesome, groundbreaking new lab. Um, if, we don't, if we don't think about equity and the equitable transition, I think the frictions are going to be sufficient that we're just not going to actually achieve a transition to a sustainable future. So um, to give you an idea of the program tonight, um, in a moment we're going to, I want to point to as I say this, we're going to hear from um, the lab's founder, uh, one of our professors in practice, uh, Nick Robbins, um, about what is meant by a just transition, why it's so important, um, the absolutely critical role that the finance sector can play, many of us are from that area, and, um, and Nick's vision for this new lab. So um, they are then going to have a chance to hear about some of the work of the lab. And so Brendan, down there, one of our, um, senior, our senior policy fellow in sustainable finance, Brendan Curran, he's going to take us on a deep dive um, into a real world example of mobilizing the bond market to support the sustainable transition. And then, um, so that we can actually sort of reflect on the lab's global purpose, We've got a rather esteemed panel um, of international experts. They're sort of sat there at the front at the moment. I'm not going to introduce them. I'm going to leave it to either Nick or Stefan to introduce them. Um, and they're going to give us their thoughts on the just transition. Um, and each of them has a, a really nice, different, and unique perspective. And then there's going to be a chance to put questions to our panel. So if you're virtual, um, I think you've probably seen the instructions on how to put the questions out. And then we'll take questions from the audience here at all. So, um, be preparing for your questions for that. Um, so there's a little bit more I have to say. Um, so uh, I'm going to invite Nick to the stage very soon, and then I'll be sitting down. You don't have to listen to anything more from me. But what I do want to do is take the opportunity to thank um, the absolutely fantastic generosity of our founding funders. Um, they've supported this ambitious plan, and they've been with us on this journey to establishing it. Um, and you know, obviously, without our, our founding funders, we wouldn't be able to have such high ambitions for the lab. So we're very grateful to Ontan Infrastructure Partners. Uh, they do support academic research excellence in several leading uni European universities. And I think their belief in the early vision for the lab really helped us to sort of set this process in motion. Our thanks to Barclays Bank and HSBC, two leading global banks. They have long-standing work within the Financing and Just Transition Alliance. And um, they've been instrumental in demonstrating commitment to collaborative pathways towards building a just transition. 
and they've now come together to support the work of this lab, so thanks to them. And then to Lauda's Foundation, um, who, in addition to their very generous funding um, towards the lab, they're also bringing considerable expertise um, towards the supporting the work of the lab. And I know there's people from Ontown, Barclays, HSBC, and Lauda scattered around here, so a, a, a really sort of genuine, you know, from the heart, thank you um, for making this um, lab a reality. So, um, so now we can welcome to the stage um, our founder, executive director of our new Just Transition Lab, um, Professor Nick Robbins. Thank you very much, Liz. That's you. <laughs> this is me. Um, so fantastic to see you all here today. And I'd like to add my thanks to our founding founders, Ontario Infrastructure, Barclays, HSBC, and the Lourdes Foundation. And thank all of you here uh, today for coming uh, at, to the LSE, to you online, and also to many of you beyond who be, we've been working with to really show over the last few years how important uh, the just transition is for achieving our goals of a net zero, resilient and nature positive economy and the role of finance uh, can play in that. What I'd like to do in the next few minutes is really show you the sort of context we're operating in, where we've got to on the just transition and then set out the mission and role of the, the lab and go into some of our activities um, and hopefully that will inspire you to join us in this, um, in this work. So. We're in a very bad year. We know in a very bad year we have military crises around the world, economic and social crises, environmental crises. If we're looking at the climate crisis, I think we have, in the words of uh, UN General, General Secretary Antonio Guterres, hit sort of really entered this era of global heating. This month, uh, February 2024, is going to be the warmest, the hottest February in all of human history. Um, this heat is driving loss and damage, intensifying loss and damage, which has been felt most painfully in the developing countries which have contributed least to the problem and have least capacity to respond. But we're also building a sustainable economy. In many ways, the transition in terms of clean technologies, particularly in the energy system, is now unstoppable. The problem is that this pace of change is going too, too slowly at insufficient scale and depth to hit our climate targets. And across all of this, in any country which we're operating in, I think increasingly the theme of fairness is now becoming fundamental to the transition, which is where this theme, this strategy of just transition is becoming so uh, important. For us, the just transition is an enabling strategy. It enables uh, rapid climate action, origins in the trade and union movement to make sure that as we are moving to a greener economy, we are thinking about the interests of workers and communities and other uh, stakeholders. 2015, in the Paris Agreement, the Just Transition entered the world of climate policy, and we also have the ILO's Just Transition uh, guidelines, which really set out the sort of framework for that. And we have key features, many of which will be familiar to you. The Just Transition is about maximizing the opportunities for social justice in the transition. How can we use it to, to enhance social justice? It's about leaving no one behind, particularly as we're moving away from high carbon and fossil fuels. It's about ensuring social dialogue uh, and effective uh, stakeholder participation so that people who are affected by the transition are at the table. And it's about respecting human rights in the fullest and most comprehensive sense, labor rights, but also the rights of indigenous peoples. For me, certainly, the momentum behind Just Transition now is really quite palpable. It's been growing in the world of policy, in trade unions, in civil society, business and finance. And it really came together at the last COP in COP28, where the governments of the world agreed a new Just Transition work program, and really suggesting that it is now central to climate action in every sector in the economy and every country in the world. The place where I think it has landed most strongly, the sector, the system, is the energy system. And I'd like to really look at the so two halves of the just transition. Transition out of fossil fuels and into clean energy and what the just transition uh, involves. In terms of clean energy, this could be a very, very good news story. Already, clean energy jobs exceed the jobs in fossil fuels. 
that job growth is accelerating and will continue to accelerate through the rest of this decade. This means we need to equip workers with the skills they need uh, to benefit from this jobs growth and overcome the skill shortages which are in country after country are a major bottleneck to the uh, transition. But we don't just need more green jobs, clean energy jobs. We need these jobs with decent working conditions and advancing gender equality. And this transition needs to empower communities so the communities who are hosting renewables developments, grid development, are sharing in the value that is being created. And also we are respecting human rights, particularly in the expansion of critical minerals, which we need for the transition. And we need to bring access to all the world's people to clean energy and make it affordable, which we know is so important that this cost of living crisis driven by uh, fossil fuels. So we need to use the transition to eliminate fuel poverty. On the flip side, we need to make the transition out of fossil fuels. We need to phase out fossil fuels. As well as the Just Transition Work Programme that was agreed at COP, we had this first historic recognition by governments that we need to transition away from fossil fuels. And the, the, the signature is this needs to be done in a just, orderly, and equitable way. But I think we're seeing examples in many countries where this has been done in a disorderly and potentially very unjust way. Certainly here in the UK, I've been very struck by the decision to close uh, the two blast furnaces at the steel, uh, steel plants in, in, in Port Talbot in, in South Wales, leading potentially to 3,000 job losses, devastating the local community. And that really hits, I think, uh, the national consciousness of just transition. It was on the na national news, but sadly, really, for the, for the wrong reasons. This was not a case study of the just transition. So if we're going to avoid stranded workers and stranded communities as well as stranded assets, we need to anticipate these job and regional impacts. We need to have workers and communities at the table, invest in the social protection in this process, and have credible industrial policy which brings uh, regional revitalization. Now, if we're thinking about these two halves, if this is just the energy transition, then we're going to need to mobilize finance and investment at scale. And it's to finance that I'd now like to, to turn. So according to the Financial Stability Board, we have about $500 trillion of, of assets in the global financial system, in the banking sector, in various parts of the, invest, in the investment sector, in central banks, public financial institutions. And I think we're now familiar that every dollar or rupee or real or pound in the financial system, the decisions about that need to be aligned with our climate goals. And I think now we need to say that actually all the, the, the funding and the funds in the financial system need to be supportive of the just transition. And over the last three, four years, we have seen the first signs of financial action. We have public finance programs in the EU, the Just Transition Mechanism supporting action in carbon intensive regions. We have the labor and environmental justice provisions attached to the US Inflation Reduction Act. Institutional investors are incorporating the Just Transition into their shareholder engagement programs with high carbon companies. We have multilateral development banks providing new funding lines for both governments and also the private sector. And commercial banks are incorporating just transition into their net zero plans. And we have international partnerships, the JETPs, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships with South Africa and Indonesia and Vietnam and Senegal, all providing uh, capital, public and private finance for developing countries. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, given the scale of the challenge we face, then this financial mobilization is still uh, insufficient in terms of speed and scale and depth. Uh, which is why in our report that we're launching today, we're calling for a transformation of the financial system. And this is particularly important for the emerging markets and developing economies of the so-called global south, which have only 4% of the financial assets in uh, the global financial system, have the greatest investment needs in terms of meeting climate and nature goals, and also the largest social justice gains to be made in the transition. In the report uh, that we're launching today, and there are summaries around, there's a full page which you can read, uh, but if you have a spare weekend, you can read uh, the, the longer version. And we set out the sort of why we are thinking about the need for a transformation of the financial system, just transition, and also sort of how we can go about that, how we can build on what's happening in the policy and market world. And this theme of transformation is really uh, the sort of context within which uh, we are launching the lab today. So I now want to sort of turn from context 
into the lab and set out its mission and, and operations. So there's a big task to be done. We are a small team within the LSE, and so the role of the lab is to be catalytic, to enable action and, mo and momentum in the financial system. We want to be a center for experimentation and also of excellence. And I'd like to emphasize both those words. Experimentation is we want to try new things. We do need breakthrough innovations in terms of just transition finance. And excellence in terms of integrity. We cannot afford to have justice washing, as we've seen examples of greenwashing in the financial system. And we're going to do this through four different priority areas, looking at particular financial instruments and strategies, metrics to measure performance, policy reform that's needed, and also case studies. Um, and these four priorities are really designed to respond to the pain points that we hear when we talk to financial institutions and others about just transition. They get the imperative, but they need support to actually move on. And so I'll go into a little bit more detail about how each of these respond to the obstacles we see in the financial system. So the first is that the just transition is not uh, routinely integrated into financing decisions. This is still um, a minority activity. So this is where our program in terms of financial instruments and strategies are, is going to be focused. We want to look at particular asset classes, listed equities, private equity, loans, uh, bonds. And my colleague, uh, Brendan Curran, will in a few minutes go into a little bit more detail about how we're looking at the bond market as a zone for taking forward the just transition. But we also look to look more broadly at financial strategies, particularly looking how uh, net zero plans, transition plans can incorporate uh, just transition principles so that people are at the heart of the uh, corporate drive uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to net zero. And we've been working here in the UK with the transition uh, plan task force and many of you in this room uh, to make that happen. So that's the, the first area. The second uh, challenge we face and obstacle we face is I think we see growing recognition within the financial sector of the just transition, but then much more uncertainty about what it means in practice, what good looks like, and, and particularly how we measure. And until we have clear and credible metrics, it's going to be hard for us to allocate the capital at scale. This is where we're launching our metrics program. We're not a standard setting body, but we think that we potentially can add value in highlighting where we have existing metrics uh, and applying those at the community level, the asset level, institution level, and uh, system level. The third area is that there are still inadequate rules in the market and potentially incentives to actually support the mobilization of capital. And we saw what has happened in the US with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, what, what fiscal incentives can do to the mobilization of capital. So this is where our policy reform program is going to be coming on, looking at what just transition policies are already in place. Uh, and one of our first uh, outputs this year will be a report with the uh, Climate Change Laws of the World team here at the LSE, looking at uh, what just transition policies are in place. And then our focus will be how these can be changed to mobilize policy, mobilize capital, sorry. And then the final area is leadership, as well as good rational argument as well as sensible policy, you need leaders who are willing to break with convention and, and sort of chart new, new paths. We are seeing that, individuals and institutions in the business and, and financial sector, but we need more leaders. We need more leaders who are, who are willing to, to lead uh, the charge. The way we're uh, going to be contributing to encouraging leadership is in uh, the case study program, both in terms of stimulating new examples of, of just transition, and also profiling examples already out there which are showing examples of leadership. Not perfect by any means, but examples that others can learn, can learn from. And our first case study is published today looking at uh, the UK utility SSE. So to do that, we have a great team, uh, the people in colour. Uh, the, the team of the LSE, the core team, who are, who are here uh, this evening. Um, but we're also delighted with this, is it really embedded in a much greater network of, of talent. We have a strategy council, which is our advisory board, and really pleased uh, Sharon, who's the chair of the uh, strategy council, is here, is going to be on the panel uh, in, a little, in a few, little while. And also we have Professor Stefan Chambers, who's the uh, director of the LSE's Marshall Institute, who's going to be moderating the panel. So thanks uh, to both of you. And we have Rosie and, and Andy in, in the room, and hopefully uh, Catherine McKenna online as well. 
But we also have associates uh, in the rest of LSE who bring skills and expertise that we don't have in the team, and we want to expand that range of associates, um, and a broad group of visiting researchers from around the world, again, adding to the diversity of perspective uh, and expertise. And one of those, uh, Saranjali Tandon, is there. Saranjali, welcome. Uh, is going to be joining uh, the, the panel as, as well. And this is a team that we want to, to grow as we uh, go forward. So how are we going to do this? Uh, as you'd expect, uh, we're going to undertake rigorous uh, research, uh, convene and, and undertake um, stakeholder dialogue, designing and testing solutions. This is going to be a big step forward for the lab. We don't want to be uh, sat in think tank land. We want to be out looking at real applications. Engagement with policymakers in terms of market practice, and then particularly learning from these lessons and communicating those. We'll be aiming to uh, harness LSE expertise for that, but also partner internationally. Already we're partnering with many of you here, and we want to partner more because our, our feeling is the just transition is very much a team sport. So as we look ahead, I think what we want to do with the lab, lab is really demonstrate and show that just transition is both possible and investable. Uh, we work, want to focus on financial transformations that strengthen social justice, bring faster climate and nature action, and create new sources of value. And in doing that, we have to, and we will be focusing on rooting our work in the specifics of, of place, particular countries, and in our first year, we'll be looking here in the UK, and also with partners such as Saranjali, also in India. With that, I'm going to close and ask my fellow lab member, Brendan, uh, to come up uh, and talk to you a little bit more about bonds. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, so just personally to say, it's been a long time coming, so this is quite a nice moment. So thanks to everyone within the LSE who made it possible. That's uh, kind of quite cool that you're all here, so uh, thanks for joining us. So, um, and also, also always nice to stand in front of a huge picture of my own face. That's good for my ego. Um, but yes, let's get some notes out. Um, yeah, as Nick said, uh, we're really having a growing recognition right now for the need for a just transition, but also, given a lot of our commitment, our committers and funders in the, in the room today, a uh, growing financial sector commitment also. Um, so in the lab, we really want to be thinking about, you know, moving from the why, which I think Nick very articulately laid out uh, in his opening presentation, to really thinking about the how for policy makers, for financiers, uh, and real economy actors as well. So the lab will very deliberately try to bridge that gap between the why and the how. Um, I think the why has pretty much been, ever, uh, most actors are now buying into that, and very much we want to be thinking about going into more detail for how do we deliver on a just transition across different sectors, across different instruments, uh, and across different geographies. So, yeah, as uh, was said already, I'm going to give us a little bit of an insight into how we might work within the lab, looking at our bonds markets program. I've only got five minutes, so I wouldn't really call it a deep dive, per se, but more of, a, more of a bit of a quick insight. So as many of you hopefully know, Nick said there's trillions of assets in the, in the financial sector. There are also tens of trillions of bond issuances. Um, and within the labelled market, uh, with green, social and sustainable and sustainability linked bonds, we've seen over the last 10 years a significant growth in that market uh, as investors have looked to deploy their capital uh, in a globally recognized um, asset and try to deliver on sustainable outcomes. From a just transition perspective, uh, it's not just the recognition that bond, the bond market has that makes it quite an interesting asset, but actually the accessibility to different investors and issuers. So, um, you know, issuers can, go, and much more, much more significantly than perhaps equity markets, but issuers can spread as far as, you know, local and national government, educational and health authorities, supranational entities, development banks, and even NGOs and charities can issue bonds. So that's a wide range of stakeholders who've got quite a vested interest uh, in the sort of system change that we need for a just transition. So that's why we wanted to start looking at this, to start thinking, could governments with their sovereign bond issuances start to look at the use of proceeds for specific just transition programs? 
could, as corporates start to issue their transition plans, could we weave in consideration of the just transition? As Nick said, we've done a lot on transition plans. And could we link that um, to a transition bond or any other of the label bond markets to, to deliver on that? So we're delighted to say that we will, we will be doing we will be doing that program. Um, we are partnering with the Climate Bonds Initiative, who hopefully many of you know, but in case you don't, they are widely recognized for their excellence in research, but also standard setting within the sustainable finance market, and have really helped move that labeled bond market from somewhat of a niche concept to, to uh, something that's much more mainstream. So naturally, they're, they're an ideal partner to work with us, uh, given their expertise. And I, I think uh, Magali and Lily, hi Magali, uh, are here in the room, and they've been partnering us uh, to de develop some research. In fact, we already published a report, uh, which we presented at COP28, which really, as you can see from the, the graph here, um, you see from the graph here, started to look at are there, are there actual already bond issuances that are using the language of a just transition? So we threw the methodology that CBI developed with us. We looked at their sustainable bond database um, and started to see were there issuances that were talking about climate and the use of proceeds and social. So don't, I think, get carried away by the 500 billion that is there. I think that's, that's why we use the language of just transition energy related. But what we wanted to look at was were there issuers already issuing sustainable bonds that started to use that language of just transition. And we found that there were, but there's a lot more to be done in terms of could we st stimulate and could we encourage um, greater issuances that are very specifically dedicated to a just transition. And can we start to look at barriers within the, more, the market in terms of standards and other financing frameworks that could be worked on through our research to, to, to get further issuances that are very specifically focused on a just transition. So. We now we're in the lab. That was previously, so in the, the pre-lab period, but we were delighted to do that research uh, with CBI. We're now going to be deepening this relationship and starting to look at how bond markets can really be supportive of a just transition. We don't have a predetermined outcome in mind. I want to make that very clear for anyone who works in different bond markets. We're not saying at the outset we need a just transition label. We have plenty of labels already. More we want to explore, I guess, in dialogue with issuers, investors, uh, and other stakeholders. Um, what are the barriers at a systemic level, at a market level for more issuances? And perhaps secondly, and very much in line with the kind of raison d'etre of the lab, we really want to work with um, trailblazers or pioneers or first-of-a-kind issuers. We might want to work with us to look at their existing sustainable financing frameworks um, and work with us in a very collaborative way to see if we can encourage greater consideration of the just transition within that. So as I said, it was just an insight. Um, so I'm going to conclude there, but there's lots more uh, information available on our website. Um, also myself, uh, my colleague Antonina Scheer, uh, and my colleague uh, Sasha Puiska will be at the drinks after if you want to ask us more questions about this. We'd be delighted to talk more because, as I said, we need lots of dialogue and lots of um, collaborators with us on us. So I'll stop there and hand over to Stefan Chambers, director of the Marshall Institute and the fantastic panel uh, to, yeah, kick us off. Thanks. If, if I lean too far away from the mic and you stop hearing me, wave, throw something, <coughs> yell, um, because I'm going to be trying to focus on you all. And okay. Yeah, I, um, I think I'm close enough to the mic, um, but if I'm not, somebody sent me a message telling me to stick closer to it. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here and to be part of this thing which I'm going to call a movement. 
Um, and you've heard about the moment we're in, so this is the moment for the movement. Um, uh, and it's really important that we recognize the moment and the movement. And I'm honored to have people who've thought long and hard about the various complex, nested, overlapping issues that make the just transition. We have three very distinguished panelists. Um, uh, to my left, um, physically, um, rather than politically, uh, is Sir Anjali Tanu, um, who's with the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. To her left, again physically, Satwa <laughs> Raymond, co-chair of Scotland's Just Transition Commission. Um, and to her left, Sharon Burrow, um, who chairs our Strategy Council for this Just Transition Finance Lab. Um, the plan is that I'm going to ask each of these distinguished people some questions. Um, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to ask them some questions. So start thinking about your finely honed question. Try to frame your question when it comes <coughs> as a question. Um, and uh, I will be getting questions both online and uh, in person. So we look forward very much to that. And I want to start with, I guess, the most obvious question, which is to ask each of you, starting with you, Sharon, what just transition means for you? So just transition means exactly as Nick described it, a, a transition that meets the test of speed and scale we need for climate action to stabilise the planet, but one that involves people, workers and their communities, and leaves no stranded people and no stranded assets, uh, not just no stranded assets, but no stranded people and no stranded communities. In this fractured world today, it actually means building trust through inclusion. Because if you don't have the trust, and let's face it, trust is broken down amongst almost all institutions. So the only way to build trust is to actually go to the heart of the consultative processes with people and look at co-planning, co uh, transparency, and indeed monitoring of outcomes that ensures that it's just, fair, inclusive, whatever words you want to use. But just transition is about people-centred transitions. Okay. Thank you. Super clear. I'll hang on to people-centred transition. Your answer to the same question. Um, what she said. What she said. <laughs> um, but actually, what I think is really important coming here today, and I really do want to start by welcoming the launch of the lab and that it's got a focus on just transition and the way it's just been described, as opposed to just net zero. There's been a lot of activity around net zero, and, and I think what's critical during this phase is to see how we maintain equity and justice at the heart of the changes that we're trying to make, that we look at how we can tackle some of the inequalities we have baked in currently. I mean, my day job is that I, I work around issues of poverty and inequality, and I've seen the impact of the cost crisis and the energy cost crisis on um, the people that um, I work with. And so in order for them to want to be part of the transition, we need to make it so that they're helping shape it in a way that's not going to leave them behind or leave them in poverty. And I think it's critical to bring together finance, decision makers, policy makers, with communities to look to see how that's going to work best. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, um, I'm trying not to repeat anything. <laughs> uh, uh, but I think, as an economist, um, it's part of the original puzzle, which is to say that how do you grow uh, without creating these inequalities. Mm -hmm. Can you think about an economy which has profits, uh, but also has people at the center of it? And I think uh, what just transition means to me is to say that let's go back to the original problem and see can we maximize uh, mm -hmm. the output, can we maximize welfare uh, in the sense of Pareto optimality as we've heard it many times. That is to say to make some people better off without making others uh, worse off. So can we go beyond the frontiers that we have imagined so far uh, in terms of growth and productivity? 
just very quickly, you're, you, you're an economist, so I think I'm allowed to ask you this. <laughs> none of you have none of you have, have said anything about trade-offs, or, or, mm. or um, as it were, this making, this requiring some people to be less well off. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if, if, if I'm allowed to have a follow-up question, particularly um, from an economist point of view. Where do the trade-offs sit here, if at all? There will always be trade-offs, uh, but you know, I've been thinking about it, Stefan, for a while. Can we go back to the equation of profits again and to say that can we take some of it away uh, to make others better off? So think about it in the sense of what we've been talking in the last one year about taxes on windfall profits. Um, mm. Or talk about corporate social responsibility, uh, which is mandated in India. And are these ways in which you can think about uh, minimizing or effectively removing um, some of the trade-offs? Okay. So you've very helpfully given a couple of examples of how to minimize. So I'm going to ask each of you now again in turn <laughs> to give me some examples about what this means in practice, because I think that you know, as a as a as a, as a as a proposition about an imperative, we would all assent to this. It gets complicated when we start to think about what it really means. So, can you give us an example? Well, I think the four pager has a great little diagram that talks about intergenerational and intragenerational equity, and describes the processes uh, um, through recognitional uh, justice, through the distri distributional justice, and I think that's a great frame. But I would say to you, there are going to be trade-offs. We will not make the grade in terms of net zero, mm -hmm. climate action, or climate justice, if you don't uh, actually be honest with people. And social licence is always about trade-offs, but the, the difference is you'll only get a social licence if you actually allow people to have a say about that. what, what that looks like, whether it's our ecosystems, whether it's the distribution of, uh, um, you know, financing and profits, whether it's about uh, ownership. In the case of Indigenous peoples, one mm -hmm. of the big shifts we have to see is that people start to recognise that the land on which we need to build grids, where you're going to put uh, industrial centres, place-based developments, that Indigenous people are landowners and that they actually have an equity stake, not just uh, you know, a, 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 a stakeholder um, kind of respect. For workers, of course, it means that workers must trust and therefore yes. their families and communities that there is, in fact, a, uh, a trajectory of secure jobs, okay. secure incomes, okay. you know, um, absence of poverty and, and, uh, and other, you know, interests for community building. So there will be trade-offs, but give people the choice of what they are You'll get your social licence, at least you've got a better chance of getting a social licence, and then we'll start to see the speed we need a, to get to scale. So, so hence your, your um, um, emphasis on people-centred mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so I think we're, I'm going to come back to this, but, but examples in your experience. Yep, sure thing. Um, I mean, as, a, as a commission, we've just um, decided on our work programme for the coming year and we're very much taking a people in place approach to it. Last year, we took a sectoral approach mm -hmm. to our work. So we looked at energy, we looked at built environment and construction, we looked at transport, and we looked at land use and agriculture. Because part of our brief is to scrutinize and advise the government on the just transition plans that they're producing. So in relation to transport, if I give you an example, um, there is the, the target to reduce car kilometres by, by 30%, which we think is a massive opportunity for communities and places, but it needs the right planning and the right investment, and it also needs to stop people thinking about it as a journey to net zero. We saw fantastic examples of an area's journey to net zero, but it wasn't integrated and what we felt was missing was coherence across different mm. services and policy areas, which would make it land in a positive way in local communities. So during the day, we saw the fantastic infrastructure for EV charging that had been developed in this city. In the evening, we met with local communities from some of the most deprived 
and impoverished areas of the city. Their concerns were public transport and an effective public transport infrastructure. And I think one of the big things we need to do here is think about how do we bring people with us? And in order to do that, we've got to make this relevant to what matters to them. And I'll stop there, I could go on. Yeah, do, you want to, do you want to add to this? I mean, I think this, this idea of people-centered mm -hmm. solutions and trade-offs um, um, uh, is super important mm -hmm. because otherwise we end up with tractors and, and ULEs and, and um, so I wonder if you have any kind of policy-inflected examples that we might consider. No, in fact, uh, I think uh, there are examples from India on instruments, regions, and companies that are all sort of coming together, uh, I would imagine, as a picture of just transition in India. So let's start uh, quickly on the instrument. Um, India's focused around reskilling uh, of mm -hmm. individuals, and I think there's been a great kickstart of financing instruments. So there's a social impact bond, uh, which the government, along with foundations and philanthropies, has launched. Uh, the aim is to skill 50,000 people, 60% of which are women, and I think that's a great step forward and it's replicable for the transition. Mm -hmm. In terms of companies, uh, just to give you a perspective, uh, public sector enterprises in India are actually very fossil fuel dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in, in the sectors that will transition and you have plans being laid out on what this transition would mean and I think there is some degree of thought on what it means for the employees. And I think the third element, which is very important, is that it's not a balanced transition. Why? Because there are pockets of concentration of yes. resources, like coal, uh, which is central to India's growth story. And amongst these, uh, one of the states, which is Jharkhand, uh, is uh, the main source of coal. And what we see there is that there is strategic thinking. 17 institutions have come together to work on seven pillars of work on just transition, which includes thinking about sectors of the future, uh, also thinks about climate finance, uh, as well as what this means uh, in terms of communities, and it's all on stakeholder consultation. So I think it's all coming together. How do you reconcile, or, or how have you thought about reconciling what is essentially technocratic financial instruments, let's leave it at that, and what you rightly say is essentially um, participatory, um, kind of organic, people-centered um, solution finding? Because those two things, at least, at least are possibly intention. And I know you've all thought a little bit about this, so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna ask you. Well, they shouldn't be um, separate silos. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take it from my previous role as a trade union leader globally, I can tell <coughs> you that unions are pretty good in many countries at building collective wealth. We built mm -hmm. pension funds, superannuation in my country. They're now um, at least, uh, you know, around a quarter of that non-banking financial institution, uh, institutional finance. Some of the, the values that were built for building collective wealth to provide people with dignified income, I have to say, has been lost. Mm -hmm. You know, you put it in the hands of mega asset managers and who, you know, are value less unless it comes to profit take, and we don't see the distributional uh, focus we need. So we need to shift the finance industry. That's at the major area, and of course, along with that, banks and other institutions. But if they put just transition at the heart of their thinking, they can drive the companies. Not enough of them are doing that, but they can set the conditions, like any procurement um, conditionality, they can set the conditionality, mm -hmm. and that's what we need to see. But beyond that, there are also layers of, you know, we also built building societies because, you know, I'm old enough to remember when working people couldn't get loans for anything <laughs> and were desperate and they're now banks. They're still mutuals, but they're banks. And so it's not that we can't build collective wealth. It's actually what are we building it for and what's the, the people-centred uh, conditionality at the heart of that. And then <coughs> I would say, as we look at energy for the poorest of the poor, then we need to think that, you know, with the right backing, the kind of, um, you know, loan guarantees, the de-risking, et cetera, even at the poorest um, community level where you're trying to provide, in many cases, off-grid 
you know, um, support for households with no energy security, of which they can build livelihoods, then again, I can tell you that our self-employed women's association out of India or many other uh, groupings, even in, in the informal sectors, know how to build wealth. Mm -hmm. They just need the backing to do so. Yeah. You, you, you were strongly assenting. I was, actually. It's great. I don't know why I'm on this panel. She's saying it all, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> I suppose I want to bring it back to, to think about how, how private finance can play a role in things like community wealth building. You know, we've got a big focus on community wealth building in Scotland. We've got a community wealth building bill. We're currently looking at a sustainable development and well-being bill in the country. And a lot of that is about how do we begin to get together um, people from finance and the people who live locally, as you were saying, silos that have been disconnected to come together on a local level as well as on a regional and national level to look to see what's actually going to make the difference, what's going to be sustainable and what's actually going to provide you with a workforce that's willing to stay with you. you know? And so I think good work, fair work, looking at all these things, actually shifting the lens of finance to begin to see how we can develop things from the bottom up in the way, as you've said, we have done before, is going to be absolutely critical. Um, I mean, I think this is one of the greatest challenges, it's the greatest challenge we're going to face in my lifetime and probably a lifetime of generations before me. And I think that's why we do have to stop thinking about how <coughs> have we done things and think about how we need to start doing things differently. And the last thing I just want to say on this, I think that's why some, one of the things Nick spoke about earlier, which was the metrics, is going to be critical to this. You know, are we measuring the right thing? Do we have it at the center of it? And how do we use that to inform and shape what's, what needs to happen? I couldn't agree more. It, it took yeah. about 100 years for us to develop accounting standards that allowed us to compare a retailer in, in Brighton um, with a um, professional service firm in yeah. New York. And it kind of works. I mean, it's not perfect, otherwise there wouldn't be hedge funds, but it kind of works. <laughs> uh, yeah, get it but, right, But, but we have no idea how to do that for mm -hmm. all the externalities that, are, that, are, that, that we all know mm. exist. Um, I'm going to ask a slightly provocative question before I go on to ask you, each of you, how this initiative, this movement, this lab um, uh, can help. Okay. The provocative question is, you talk about private capital uh, and, and all other things being equal, private capital has shown itself to be entirely willing mm. to countenance what you might call mm -hmm. moral imperatives. Let's call it impact. Okay? Um, uh, and indeed, not to, not to want oil and gas when oil and gas are really cheap. Okay? Mm -hmm. But when oil and gas are really expensive, the opposite is true. And I just wonder how you think, whether you think that, that, that it, this is a tractable problem. And, if, and, and then we're going to go on to this. So how? How do we help? Well, I mean, we need legislative yeah. um, policy solutions, of course. And we need uh, the incentives for people, sadly, to do the right thing. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if we get the compliance structures right, if this is so important, this transition, which is really an industrial transition, mm -hmm. of which climate uh, stability uh, is in fact the outcome. So if we are actually creating an industrial revolution across all sectors, then we need to make sure that in fact the policy is there. There's, there's a great dependence, too much dependence, on people saying governments will fund this or governments will do this. I mean, public finances are not exactly in a great shape. They do have power, however, legislative power, seed funding power, de-risking power. There's a whole range of financial incentives they can create which will drive the industry generally. But there's also, in my view, the great hope of younger generations. Because if you, if you follow um, the research and you listen to young people, really smart people who in previous generations would have been attracted by the profit take are actually not. They are much more collective in their thinking about a value set. And so if we can actually bridge the gap, that intergenerational gap, 
between those of us who want to see the finance industry shift and all the big players within it, and those younger people who are going to be, in fact, the designers and leaders of a people-centred transition, then I think the sky's the limit. I agree. On on you go. No, I, I think um, another way to think about the problem with the financial sector is to say that are there any costs that can be demonstrated uh, yes. to say that you know this will be the cost if you don't act and I think um, we try to we try to figure it out on the carbon pricing side but can we show it uh, for social costs and I think the second way to do this uh, which Nick and I are going to uh, you know put all our effort behind is to show that are there demonstrable cases where you can say that you know there is compatibility between return mm -hmm. and social outcome and if develop a framework to think about here are the examples of how you can make it happen through a construct of metrics as well as uh, instruments. I would just add to that, that that I think we need to think about how we price just transition into investment decisions and innovate the way we can use financial instruments to help meet major investment needs, particularly if they're not looking very attractive or commercially viable, but we know are absolutely essential like retrofitting, yeah. do you know, as an example of that. Um, and I suppose that goes back to what do we mean by commercially viable? Do you know, does the balance have to shift within that? And I think one of the things that, in terms of what the public sector can do, is we need to rethink how we do procurement yeah. and building just transition into the heart of procurement. I couldn't agree biggest, more, biggest Stefan. The biggest procurer in the world is the government. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Exactly. 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 No, so you have to come back to that government power. Mm. But on the other hand, if you think about pricing in just transition, and this is some of the work the lab will do, then you've got the Nick Stern Vera Songway report, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Nick's been so encouraging of this. In fact, with the two Nicks, I feel like <laughs> I've, been on, I've been on a 10-year journey, really. And, uh, and since 2015 and before. And so consequently, though, if you, um, if you actually think about that report, it says of the four point, remember we said there was $500 trillion out there. Yeah. Yeah. They say you need 4.4, .4, I think, or 5. 2.4. Uh, that's in the developing economies, but overall, mm -hmm. something like 4. Point something or other. And of that, 75 billion is just transition financing. Now, think about that and the ratios. This is not some outrageous claim. This is actually doable, can be costed, you can do the metrics, and we've got to get it right. Which is a perfect link to my last question, which is how do we embed some of the pre some of the necessary answers to some of the necessary questions in the work of the lab? But I'm just going to pause before I ask each of you to to uh, to tell me that and say start getting your perfectly formed questions <laughs> ready, because as soon as each of the panelists has given me their answer, I'm going to come to you for for questions. So I'm going to start with you, Sir Angeli, on this one. What, 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 what would you like this lab to be doing in order to progress this movement? And it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't even have to be constrained by what is already happening or what we already know we can do. No, I think um, uh, some of the ideas that Nick and I have uh, on the lab is really from the questions we got asked over the last two years on what does just transition really mean? Mm -hmm. How do you make it practical? And I think uh, that is the effort that we seek to put into the lab uh, over the next one year at least to talk about uh, you know, what are these instruments? Uh, who's doing, uh, who's putting their effort behind certain activities? Can we map the space to say that there will be certain activities that will be funded by the private sector and there are definitely certain activities where we will need public finance and there's no ignoring it, and I think uh, that's really what I think can be achieved uh, by the lab. Okay, super helpful. Thank you. We recently had a round table on um, the investment challenge and investment as part of the Just Transition Commission in um, Scotland, and it was interesting because it brought together people from across sectors, public sector, third sector, 
private sector, etc. Very large multinational institutions, right down to things like um, small community organisations. I think we wanted to look at the role that a national bank could play because there's a Scottish National Investment Bank, etc. And 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 it, I was surprised. I shouldn't have been really, but that these aren't people who get together to talk very often with each other. And I think that's one of the key roles that the finance lab um, could play in bringing together those different worlds, finance, policy, labor, civil society, to, look, to have that conversation and to be honest with each other. Because we're all having separate conversations at the moment. So we're still siloed, you know, even though we keep talking about how we shouldn't be. And, and within that, I think it's really important to start having um, conversations about when we're speaking about equitable sharing of costs and benefits, what that also means. Because up until now, in the way things have worked, those, those who've held the money have held the power. You know? And if we want to move away from that into looking at how we do things more equitably, I think there has to be a bit of power sharing as well as part of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I would say definitely convening power. There's no doubt about yeah. that. And, yeah. and as an independent uh, set of, uh, you know, of academics and, uh, you know, finance uh, industry reps and labour and civil yeah. society, there has to be provocative analysis Absolutely. as well. Yeah. But developing the metrics to give people yeah. confidence and legitimacy about, as uh, Nick says, how, you know, what looks, what looks like, mm -hmm. what does good look like? And of course, that has to be through the eyes of people. Yeah. And uh, and then I would argue that it's also creativity. There is a lot of we have to shift the finance sector as it is, no doubt about that. But we also have to look at where is the creativity mm -hmm. to generate the the uh, support and value creation to get things done across the board. And I know. Um, if I can give a practical example, Stefan, and I'm going to embarrass them, but my colleagues from the International Transport Federation, Gemma and Jeremy, are here. And yesterday, Jer Jeremy and I had a long talk about what's the, the layers of finance mm -hmm. for shifting the transport sector. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is public transport. How do you fund that? Well, Brendan gave you some ideas with a just transition mm -hmm. uh, focus tonight. How do you actually ensure that? Um, uh, that the, the industrial transport, you know, the big industries, auto, shipping, aviation, what's the finance look like there? It's very different. And then what's the finance look like for shifting the informal economy, which can be public transport, i.e. the GBs in the Philippines, particularly as a case study, but, uh, you know, kind of uh, the bus systems in Peru, but on a renewable energy basis, etc. So, this this kind of work can be assisted greatly by the expertise and the support and the capacity for research that this lab will have okay. across many sectors. Super helpful. So, I think I've heard kind of two broad two broad categories mm -hmm. of thing that the lab might do. One is in the realm of parsing out the, the, the financial structure of, of, of entire sectors. The other is in the realm of digging deeper into particular cases, but also financial instruments mm -hmm. of the bo of a bond-like yeah. characteristic. And then the second, the second piece uh, is more human-centered, and it's mm -hmm. about people-centered mm -hmm. solutions. Mm -hmm. It's about um, um, uh, it's about the just bit of the yeah. transition rather than the technocratic bit of the transition. And it's about the role of the of the lab as a con as a as a place mm -hmm. to bring um, system actors together who might not necessarily um, uh, meet and talk. If I've heard if I've heard correctly, that's what I've heard mm -hmm. from the three of you. Um, so it's time for your questions, and I'm looking at the camera too, um, and hoping that I'm close enough to the mic for those people not in the room to hear. So who's going to be brave and ask the first question? Um, there are people um, uh, with mics in the room, so if you put up your hand um, and tell us your name and ask your question. Thank you. I'm Sarah Gordon. I'm a visiting professor in practice here at Grantham. Huge congratulations to Nick, Brendan and the team on the launch of the lab. Um, 
it's a really optimistic moment, but we all know there are plenty of reasons for massive pessimism, particularly in the UK at the moment. And I had a question, uh, really, I mean, partly for Satwak, but for the panel as a whole, around when you have parties like the Reform Party who are actually campaigning now on a manifesto which includes abolishing net zero targets mm -hmm. as part of its um, manifesto commitment. You have the Labour Party reneging on its £28 billion, although who knows what they'll do if they come into power, um, but reneging on the £28 billion green spending pledge. What is the lab or what should the lab be doing in terms of the converting the unconverted or, or really engaging with the people who now more violently than ever dismiss every single argument that was made in today's very interesting and enjoyable event. Thank you. Zappa, <laughs> uh, you're on your, your, your I'm on the You've spot got to go first for with this, this one. Aren't I? <laughs> Can I opt out of it by saying I'm from Scotland? <laughs> 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 no, I actually think uh, I, that's a really, really important question. I went to hear um, someone at an event recently who spoke about that we're not going to win the arguments for um, a just transition to net zero if people think they're going to be poorer. And I just think one of the things we need to do is think about how we reframe what we're talking about in this thing, you know. I mean, if poorer means we consume less, then yes, lots of people are going to feel that they're going to be poorer. And that's what I think drives so many of the people who try to push away from these targets. It's change, it's different, it's going to be difficult. And I think what we need and what would be great for the lab to be able to do and be part of is to show people that actually this is possible and it's going to be possible in a way that's going to improve things for you in many ways. We need to be thinking about, I mean, I'm not a spin doctor, but we need to be thinking about the positive spins that are coming out of this, as opposed to being sucked into the arguments that people are holding. And there's always going to be those people who are going to resist change and are gonna want us to. And I think there comes a point when we stop giving them so much oxygen and start focusing on those who, who we know within the framing of it and understanding what it can bring um, will be happier to come along with it. Do you know, it's the, sorry, I got asked a question the other day, which was, um, do you know, your co-chair of the Just Transition Commission, do you think we're gonna get a just transition? And I said, well, I know for a fact we're not if we don't try, you know? And I think that's what I'm gonna, and, I'm hoping that people will change their minds when they're in power and they get to see how much benefit will be drawn from this for, for the globe and for the UK as well as, and not just think about the costs. Great answer. Question online. We have two questions from online, one on the work of the lab, the theory of change of the lab, and another more on content. The one on the lab itself is, does the, tra does the just transition as framed by the lab focus exclusively on energy, or will it explore how finance flows enable just transitions in other spheres? And the second question is immobilizing capital to developing countries, particularly such as through bonds, there is a risk of increasing those developing countries' debt burdens. What are some of the key things we need to think about when trying to facilitate a just transition on a global scale? Great, got them both. Um, I'm going to ask Nick to answer the first one, and possibly the second one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, great. No, um, sorry, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, so the first one, I did talk a lot about energy, so it's a very good question. We, we've done work in the past looking at uh, just transition and nature, and in, in the UK looking at the agricultural sector. And to some extent, I think actually the challenges around agricultural and nature are to some extent more profound than in the energy sector because the, the community dimension is so in, intrinsic. Um, so it's an area we would like to do more work and we didn't really have time to, uh, to feature it. Um, but certainly we have in the financial world a focus on climate but nature is coming up fast. The intersection between the two is important. And certainly if we're looking at anything around uh, carbon offsets and so on, there's a very strong just transition dimension. So I think it's an area that we would definitely like to do uh, more work in. So it's a good question. On the second uh, question about um, uh, increasing 
finance for the just transition into the global south. I think it's something we we're very uh, focused on, and it's going to require flows of uh, grant, increasing flows of grant finance, uh, concessional finance, as well as uh, finance which is return seeking, such as bonds and so on. And I think that's going to be one of the big. Uh, challenges this year, certainly in the climate negotiations, when we're going to get trying to get to a new uh, climate deal. But I think the experience so far of these so-called just energy transition partnerships, so there needs to be more on the um, uh, the grant, the sort of the the, 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 the financing, which doesn't uh, bear bear debt and interest and so on. Can I just say it? You know, the cost of capital for the developing world is absolutely totally inequitable. Mm -hmm. And while we all understand risks, most of the people in this room would have some governance responsibilities, nevertheless, a lot of it is simply prejudicial. So if you can, in fact, bring in the instruments like, uh, you know, loan guarantees or just uh, or de-risking, etc., then you actually make the cost of capital affordable, and that goes a long way to, to addressing some of that, as well as Nick's, as Nick's point about you know, how do we get more grant money in? How do we collect, collectively get big donor countries and finance institutions to take that leap of faith? But the other thing is too about, again, going back to how you create wealth within the country. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, some of those instruments are important for that, but we need to think a lot more about that across all sectors, because it isn't just energy. Energy is the foundation for a whole of, uh, of economy transition. So that's everything, industrialisation, agriculture, services, construction, you na name it. The whole gamut of our society and more as we add different areas of, uh, of uh, industrial development will be vital. Thank you, thank you. Okay, question just there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jeremy Anderson from the International Transport Workers Federation. Uh, so thank you, Sharon, for mentioning the example of, uh, the, you. <laughs> of, of the, the jeepney minibus drivers in the Philippines. And I'm also thinking of what you said near the beginning about the importance of building trust. So you, if, you, if you look at that 75 billion figure uh, around you know, the just transition needs, one concern I have is that if just transition is not seen as a standard kind of investable asset, does this mean that investors will be looking for a higher return? And Sharon, you were just talking about the whole dynamic of the global south where very high punitive rates are, are being charged in, in climate finance currently. So if we're talking about just transition, investing in just transition, how do we make sure uh, that it's a, a reasonable and fair rate of return, okay. not a punitive rate of return. And thinking of example in the Philippines where we have these minibus dr yeah, drivers protesting because of the, the very high costs being placed upon them. So, so not just the driving down the cost of capital by using innovative first loss guarantee mechanisms. How, how, how do you stop, as it were, the uh, investors um, assuming higher risks than are actually apparent? You, you, you're, you're, you're um, my economist neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is exactly the kind of problem uh, that we have been dealing with and trying to think of what can the solution be. One, of course, goes back to pricing um, of these costs that are associated with it. It could be done through regulation uh, to say that you know there are these standards that, that you have to meet. I think uh, there's also been some talk about uh, reforming the way other financial sector actors respond uh, to an instrument and to a country, which is which includes the credit rating agencies. That's a very big agenda. Uh, I don't know how you solve that quickly, uh, but I think that's one other way to uh, at least draw a wedge uh, or to close that wedge of costs between uh, countries. I think those two are my own okay. to you. Brief, brief. Very quickly, there's a couple of ways of approaching it. Jeremy and I had this conversation, but if you think about those GB drivers, you know, the investment in their tools of trade, the, the actual automotive uh, capacity is everything. So if you actually had uh, loan guarantees and build worker cooperatives or loan guarantees for those, um, because some are already uh, 
you know, employees by any other name in an informal sector of someone who's bought four or five <coughs> or six of these, they're not all individually owned, then you can make the cost a normal investment cost in terms of changeover of stock. But if you don't do that, then you are absolutely leaving these people to a, a government that's not going to fund this with any degree of equity or indeed financial actors who will demand a rate of return that is unsustainable. So we've got three questions stacked up. Person with the microphone, person without the microphone, <laughs> person without the microphone. You, you just got in, last person there. Those are going to be our last questions. Then I'm going to come back and ask each of you for closing remarks. Um, and I think what I might do, with your permission, is run these questions together. So it's absurd. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, Tony Green from the British Business Bank. I just wanted to um, bring the millions of smaller businesses in the UK, tens of millions in India, into the conversation and ask whether you thought finance was actually a key lever for catalyzing a just transition for smaller businesses, or whether actually that shifts in the real economy through policy, regulation, tax, and so on, that really needs to drive that. Is finance actually the lever we need to use for that? Okay, good question, great question. Hi, uh, Louise Pryor, Chair of Ecology Building Society and an actuary. Um, as part of this, are you going to look at the role of insurance, which finances risk, and at the moment, the big insurers are, seem to be very willing to support and enable activities which are destroying the world. And how can we get them to support and enable activities that people actually want to do? Great question. Um, right here on the, on the row three, I think. Thank you. Um, Mathieu Firmion, AXA IM. I'm an EG analyst and I'm working on the just transition part of a coalition in France. Uh, one question I have from our engagement with issuers is more and more how we mitigate the risk of just transition uh, washing. Because more and more companies are talking about just transition in order to avoid the transition. Um, some companies will say, look, we are part of uh, a DM world, uh, and it's complicated to, for, for these people. Um, so how do we mitigate this risk? Hi, Helena from the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. Um, we're a coalition of governments and uh, private sector organizations, and I'm taking a bit more of an international cooperation look. But COP, we saw the launch of the first Just Transition Work Program. Parties recently submitted um, submissions to define what it was going to look like. I wondered if the panel could share views on how they think the work program should be built out to be effective, how finance should be built in, and how the Just Transition Finance Lab is going to interact with the work program. With the work program? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so four questions. One, Quite a, quite a level of abstraction. Is finance the right lever for this? Uh, or are there other, I'm guessing, more behavior or, or, um, or policy related things? Second, what's the role of insurers? Um, um, third, uh, how do we mitigate the risk of, of what Nick was calling justice washing uh, um, um, uh, in the opening? Um, uh, and fourth, how do we build out the work program for a just transition? Um, and I'm going to go uh, first to the build-out question to Sharon. So, um, can I flip it just a little? So, on the small to medium enterprise piece, particularly those uh, businesses where we're not seeing the shift in oil and gas or industrial uh, areas or servicing that we need, then if you think about what uh, st any startup needs, and that mm -hmm. then transforms into ongoing support for the, the build up of the industry. Then we need debt venture funds. We have, you know, uh, venture capital funds in many countries, but that's not going to make the grade for those industries that will need indeed five, seven, maybe ten years of patient capital. Been talking about patient capital and patient debt for a long time. But we need to do that particularly for those SME sectors. You need all the other stuff. The second bit about justice washing is just vigilance. Just vigilance. Yes. You have to call out the, the bad players and, you know, try to help them along the way, but call them out. 
On on um, on the there was another vital question, which was the final one you asked me. What was that? Um, how to build out the work the program. Pathways. Oh, so building out the work pathways is, I think, about partly, you know, the answers across here. One is a sectoral approach, but actually it's also, if you take it from a people-centred approach, then it won't be one sector in itself. I'm passionate about, yes, industrial transition, but place-based, we have got the best opportunity in generations for place-based development, and that means equitable transitions in a way that we simply haven't thought about before. And can I just say the insurance industry has to be part of that. Like, if you go back to the origins of insurance and showing my age, but when you had government, uh, basically they were mutuals. They were actually there to support, you know, the worst things that could happen to people. And they weren't profit-taking institutions. Now they're mega profit-taking institutions. but. There's some hope. If you look at, uh, you know, the finance paper from Aviva and Steve Waygood and others, there's hope that these uh, insurers are actually going to get it right. You know, ten years ago, people like me and the trade union movement said insurance was unaffordable for working people. Increasingly, mm -hmm. you've seen the California situation where we're not going to even insure mortgages now. So God forbid. We need to reform that sector and let's play with the actors who've got the courage to say so and make it happen. Okay, I'm going to merge, we've run out of time, I'm going to merge my request for final words with any, with either of you wanting to address any of those four questions um, as a preliminary and, and I'm going to come first to you um, and then, um, so final words. My final words are quick. Um, in India, the challenge of just transition is about priced at $900 billion. Uh, if you look at it in a long-term horizon, it's not very much if you deflate it by the GDP. Uh, what is our investment rate? It's about 30%, savings rate is 30%. So it's really about changing th the thought around how do you fund activities, and that answers one of the questions, which was whether finance is the only lever. Well, of course it's not, it's a combination of things. But finance gets behind profitable activi activities. And why you see these large con conglomerates today is because finance supports them. And I think uh, it may not be the only lever, but it is an important lever. So there needs to be a change there. Yeah, completely agree. So far. OK, thank you. Um, well, I I'm going to end by saying I think people in place need to be at the heart of what we do. For example, when we're thinking about how we are leveraging in public and private finance, um, how we do that in different communities and places with them having an equal say in what's going to be happening in those areas. I've spoken about power. I think power dynamics need to shift in this. Otherwise, we're going to be keep coming up with the same, the same solutions, the same ideas if we don't actually shift our whole frame of thinking and who we engage in in this because what we're looking at is something that's actually a whole system transformation in a way that we've not had to do so before and one of the things I've not spoken about in um, up until now is what role for example there needs to be in how we leverage in private and public finance to develop the social infrastructure that we're going to need if we're going to make this a successful um, transition how we ensure some form of income security, particularly for those on the lowest incomes. And we're doing a piece of work in Scotland at the moment, looking at a minimum income guarantee. And part of that will be made up from an income from work for those who are able to work. So therefore, good quality, fair work plays a large part in that. But if we're going through a period that, um, where so much is unknown, and potentially there are so many risks, We've spoken about how to de-risk things for the finance sector, for some of the, the people who need to make those changes. We need to be thinking also about how we de-risk it for people so that they can begin to make some of the changes that we all need to make. Yeah. I'll just let's make it happen. Yeah. Can I say <laughs> there's a lot of power in this room <laughs> and we already have some great partners in the funders and other collaborators, but you know, I'm just here as the advise, one of the advisory group, but this is such an exciting moment. 
2015, we got Just Transition. My nightmare was when I woke up the next day and said, oh my God, how do we make it happen? <laughs> and I must say, Nick Stern, Nick Robbins, many of you have been right there on this journey to get to the point where you asked about the work plan, somebody over here, then yeah. we need every government yeah. to put their ambitions in the NDCs and everything they put in the NDCs, which they've got to renew next year, will have to have investment align alignment and it has to have just transition at the heart of that. Rousing, rousing. I have <laughs> <laughs> I have precisely two final words. The first is thank, and the second is you. <laughs> <laughs> thank Next. you, Stephen. and thank you, and thank you all. Thank you. So there's one more slide, um, <laughs> and uh, this is oh, to yeah. this uh, is encourage you to to read what we've already produced on day one. Um, visit our website because then you'll see the response. Uh, that the lab has made uh, to the Just Transition Work Program. My colleague, Jodian Wang, has, uh, has led that. And thank God we said the same thing as Sharon. Uh, so that's, that's <laughs> good. Um, but it's really good getting the, the feedback here because we are a small team. We, we, want to, we don't want to boil the ocean. We want to look at particular things. But what people have said here tonight, I think, are some of the areas we do want to work in, particularly around SMEs. What, what are, what are the, the system changes around that? Where, maybe where do we need to think about financial regulation? What's the role of central banks? How do we look at supply chains for SMEs? Yes. The clusters in particular uh, places. Insurance. Very good question. There is now work being thinking about what, does, uh, what is the role of this insurance sector and, and so on. So uh, we would really like you to, to join us uh, in, the, in the lab in de very different, uh, different ways and so on. Um, this is a long-term venture at the LSE. We're not going to give up. Um, and I would like to echo my thanks. Thanks, Stefan, for your wonderful moderation to Sharon and Saranjali and Satwat. You only get to be on a panel with a lab if your name begins with S. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, thank the teams who've made all this event possible. Uh, at the Grantham Research Institute, at the fantastic PAGE team, the partnerships team mm -hmm. at ASC, which are, are truly a, a work of, of heroes, and then the, 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 the team at the Just Transition Finance uh, Lab. Thanks for you for attending here in London, for you uh, online.